Picture this, if you will. If you're sitting at the bar with your friends and you order a rum and coke, you see the bartender take a glass, put some ice in it, a little bit of cola, and a whole lot of rum. And all of a sudden, you know you're in danger territory, more than you bargained for. And all of a sudden, you are faced with a little too much Dong Ku. That little metaphor transferred over to the R6 environment where Dong Ku is located, and you have yourself a presentation, something we are going to dive into Today, we are talking about Don Ku, the fix, named after the rum. It is in the northeast corner of Sector 6, and this fix is prone to lots of congestion, especially during the Up Island push, and the San Juan and St. Thomas, St. Croix, British Virgin Islands uh, departure push as well. So we're going to explore this feisty fix in the radar environment and teach you what to look for how to project and look at it in advance and see what's going on and how to take down the intimidation factor of this fix. It is intimidating, especially when you are working R6 and all those aircraft are converging in on that point. So we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna get some facts out of the way, talk about some techniques, some methods, and just have an overall good time. Really excited that you're here with me today. Always appreciate the time we spend together. So let's dive in and uh, let's get started. Don who? Uh, Don Quixote? Uh, Don who? Mike Mike Jones? Well, not exactly. It's the fix right there. And as you see, we have the micro eARTS video map there, kind of in that area. So moving from west to east, so from, uh, if you are, if you will, in the direction of these arrows, Don Ku is the hub, a central intersection for a lot of major airways in San Juan Center's airspace. Previously, all traffic would usually go over Elmuk, and as you see, Elmuk has kind of been put to the wayside. The old girl's been retired. Only one airway emits, and it doesn't even start in San Juan Center's airspace. It used to. That's Lima 451. But as you know, Lima 451 does not traverse San Juan Center's airspace no more. It's it ends at Ilopo and it ends at Elmuk, but it goes onward to Oldie uh, through Miami Center's airspace. So let's go back to Don Ku here. So Don Ku, this fix right here, and it is that central hub for these airways. You have Yankee 356 from Miguel, Yankee 354 from Gesso, you have Yankee uh, 185, Lima 454, and Yankee 318. Yankee 318 coming from Wexit, Lima 454 coming from Panmo, and Yankee 185 uh, from Oconee, or if you want to trace it all the way back, its origins lie over Illery. So along with these airways, you also have a unpublished transition for the Oconee star, or SID, excuse me. So the Elmuk transition still exists for the Oconee uh, SID, so does the Sapo transition. As you know, we still have fixes FECO and Donku. And what do we do? Well, what did we do? When Metroplex rolled around, we had to name unpublished transitions and put them in OTAM. So, with all that traffic converging at Donku, you also have the Oconee 3 Pouty direct Donku transition. So, you have these major airways and a major SID transition, not to mention Donku and the airways associated with it, mostly Yankee 185 since it emits from Econi, you are going to deal with departures that depart Princess Juliana, St. Martin, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and Beef Island. All of the preferential departure routings for those airports going to Sector 63 will go over Donku. It's in the preferential routing. So a lot of factors at play here. So we're going to explore how to plan, project, and detect converging and other tricky situations in this area. There are some saving graces. There's lifesavers out there that you can just latch on to and use it as a technique to help you have a successful training session or run a good scenario if you are downstairs in the lab. So without further ado, now that we kind of talked about the nature of it, of the airspace, we'll get back to it, talk about some other little detail items here, looking at the video map, but let's get to a sector and take a look at uh, what a situation would look like 
when we uh, find ourselves sitting in R6 when Dongku bound traffic is just all over the place. Okay, so I'll see you at the next slide. Really excited. Ready, set, jets go. I'll see you there. I promise you such a situation will exist in reality. All these examples here for the most part are grounded in reality. As you see, we are sitting down to an R6 session. We took a whole bunch of handoffs here and without even looking in the scratch pad, all of these aircraft are inbound to Dongku. Now you see the type of aircraft is being shown, not being time shared. We can't time share it here in the presentation, but just know that all these aircraft are going towards Dongku. We'll show you the flight plans in another slide. Dongku is up here, this central fix right here, just a star. Note that it is not the scale. It is for all intents and purposes, it is somewhere in that general vicinity. And all these flight plans are real. These are real flight numbers that will be worked by you in an R6 session going northwest bound. You have United 1039, which is usually the Aruba to Newark run, FedEx 58 from Barinkin to Memphis, Delta 559, Sam Juan to Atlanta, JetBlue 743, VC Bird to JFK, Air Canada 960 or it's 961, Bird to Toronto, Delta 349, usually St. Lucia to Atlanta, and that's everybody. So this is just a little snapshot here. It's kind of biased because all aircraft are pointed at Don Ku. So exactly, yikes, what to do? Everybody pointed at Don Ku, and that happens. And more often than not, you see how they are all transitioning on more or less different airways. So it's a unique situation illustrating how traffic can all be positioned in the same geographical area and slowly but surely converging in on a common point. Because if you look at the situation now, all of these aircraft are separated. They're probably separated for 10, 15 minutes, maybe even 20 minutes, but they are all slowly converging on a common point. And we're gonna use that to our advantage. We're gonna keep things in mind. We're going to show you some techniques, but just wanted to show you what the situation looks like. Now, if the aircraft are, in this example, all on airways, but sometimes people will use direct to their advantage and the aircraft will be pointed at Donku on a random route. And sometimes that's a little more hard to project for and to take into account. And, but in many respects, it kind of makes it easier because if they're all on top of each other, superimposed, trekking towards a common point, it is blatantly obvious. Right now, looking at this, it may not be blatantly obvious that these aircraft are all in conflict with each other. But we'll prove to you that maybe not all of them are in conflict with each other, but it's going to be close. And it's going to require some projection, monitoring, and some adjustment. So let's put together a plan and let's take a look at some techniques and let's go to the next slide and uh, start uh, going over what we're really going to talk about here. Okay, so let's do it. One of our first techniques today is what we're going to discuss right now. And it's one of my personal favorites. When you find yourself in a situation knowing that aircraft are all converging upon a common point from all different angles, such as the case with Dongku, which it happens, you can use at your disposal some decision support tools that our radar system, MicroYards, has to offer. So what are we looking for exactly here? I need a factual real-time estimate of what time these aircraft are estimating Don Ku. So I would like to know what time each aircraft respectively is estimating the fix. Now the computer inside MicroYards has a function for that. It has a very good function for that. We call it the DU key. I think it stands for distinct utility. I'm not really sure. But try using the DU key to see if the distances are equidescent. So what do I mean by that? So pop up Q, the micro ERs keyboard. The DU key is located on the top right. There's a hard labeled function keys, the RDP, FDP key. We have the vector length key and the DU key, also known as the DUMI key, which is fine. You're going to select that, and you're going to slew and enter on a selected target. So select DU, click on this, and you will notice that your cursor, your position control symbol, in this case it would be an R, will turn a color. It'll turn yellow or a bright uh, gold, if you will. And then that means it's active. Whenever it's active, 
Whatever you're going to slew on next is going to result in a report. So guess what we're going to do? We are going to slew and enter on that, and we are going to slew and enter our next click. So it's going to be a succession of two clicks. Click on United 1039's target, and then click on Don Koo. And we are going to get a simple readout. And how do we interpret this? First will be the call sign. Just lets you know, hey, this is the aircraft that you requested this on. AZ stands for azimuth. Right, the direction from on the 174 azimuth range 68 miles and then the time estimating whatever geographical area you selected in the system data plane of micro yards and there it says 2327 and 02 seconds so let's try it for another aircraft click the du key and we are going to select it for delta 559 the 234 uh, 102 miles, estimating at 2332. And you see how we are getting a good snapshot of what exactly is going to happen. Now, remember, when you have climbing aircraft, in the case of Delta 559, and if you were to do this to FedEx 58, remember these aircraft are not up to speed yet. And the DU key, the report you get from that, will not account for the airspeed that they will be at at cruise or at level flight. So know that some of these reports are going to be skewed. That's why Delta 559 was used as an example. It's showing 2332, but guess what? I imagine that time will be probably closer to around 2329 or maybe 2330, depending on how fast the aircraft gets up to cruising speed while still in the climb. So now you can see if you were to do reports on all these aircraft, you would get an accurate readout of what time they are inbound over Dong Ku. Realizing that most aircraft are performing at eight miles a minute, you can quickly add up and see what kind of separation you will have as you approach Miami Center's boundary. As you see, all of these aircraft are requesting uh, the same kind of altitude stratum, right? We are talking in the uh, 30 range here. So you see how we have a 36, a 36. FedEx with a 34 request, Delta with a 36 request, that's 559, Delta 349 level at 32, and Air Canada 960 level at 34. So we have to think to ourselves, what exactly can we do to really get our hands around this and see about, in a democratic manner, if you will, being fair and in the spirit of first come, first served, divvying out these altitudes because chances are not everybody will be able to get their requested altitude when they arrive at Dong Ku. But don't worry, we have some more information for you to make you feel better about stopping aircraft temporarily. So let's get to that. Now that you know a little bit about the DU key and some of its limitations with climbing aircraft, let's show you another technique that you can use, another tool you have, an uncommon tool that you would probably not think about as a radar controller, which will really help give you the picture of the situation that is taking place over Dong Ku, way out projecting into the future. I'll see you at the next slide and we'll talk about this. It's some pretty exciting stuff. All the aircraft here are frozen in time. We have done no control actions yet, and we find ourselves here focusing on the strip bay. And you're like, Steve, strips, that's for non-radar and D-side activities. And I would agree with you to an extent. Sector 6 is a radar sector. It's very much so a radar sector. We share a common radar boundary with Miami, Santa Domingo, Punta Cana Approach, and all other San Juan Center sectors. And I agree with you, but the strips, when they have good, accurate information input into them, and what do I mean by that? It means that the times are valid, the altitudes are good, the routes of flight are reflective of the pilot's intentions, right? They are actually flying the route of flight that is shown here. They're at the altitude or climbing to the altitude as depicted uh, on the strip and also too that the times are accurate. And when I mean that, I'm talking about our VC Bird guys, whenever they are late leaving VC Bird over the boundary fix, that those times are accurate, right? And the LOPO time is accurate. And it's gonna reflect the time that the aircraft is actually over LOPO because if that time is off, it's going to affect, uh, affect every downline fix. So just make sure that the 
information is accurate. And you, you'd find out right away exactly how that is because of the times, but that's a different story for a different day about the inner workings of VC Bird and their control estimates. So we won't get off on a tangent here, but back to the strips, the idea that the computer when it calculates all the times for all these fixes that you see in the en route flight progress trip, most of the time, actually probably about 95% of the time, those times are accurate, especially whenever it's a San Juan departure or a facility that we have uh, tracking on auto acquisition. And when an aircraft auto acquires, usually upon departure, an automatic DM is sent, a departure message is sent, and these strips print out. That's when you'll get it the most accurate. That's why sometimes we don't even ask for uh, time and estimate for the fixes in Sector 4's airspace over Kika, Kinch, Ferna, Krupp, Barrow, Cheddar, all of that, because more often than not, those times are really accurate. When are they not accurate? When the aircraft is doing a different speed than reflected there, maybe they are going a lot faster, um, or they were late and we did not forward those plus times. But like I said, that's a whole argument for a different day. For the most part, the strips can be used as an awesome decision support tool to help you get a picture and to help with your projection. Maybe you're not so developed yet when it comes to projecting far out and away. What you see here, this mass throng of aircraft activity, you're like, eh, I, I, I think some of these guys can fall in line and chances are you're probably right, but you can supplement your decision and enhance your decision using all available tools. We talked about the DU key and some of its limitations. Well, now we talk about the strip times and what am I talking about? Well, depending upon the airway, you will get fixes the Dong Ku fix, whether it's in the fixed posting or somewhere on the strip. If it's posted correctly in Sector 6, you will have a Dong Ku time somewhere. And sometimes the airways don't always uh, fall into line with our strip marking and strip posting order, but we have made do. Necessity is the mother of invention and we just make it happen. But you see where Dong Ku is occurring on some of these strips, right? You see how it's the fixed posting for the first two, the next two, actually the next four are all in the next fix section. And you see how we are getting our picture painted as to what is going on with these aircraft transitioning northwest bound towards Dong Ku. We have times now associated with it. And unfortunately, what it's looking like is we do have some ties taking place. But that's good though. I would rather us know when we sit down and take the sector here, here and now, where these aircraft are geographically, right? They are still pretty far away from Dong Ku, relatively speaking. So we have time to make a decision and we have some factors to consider that we will talk about on the next slide and some techniques to follow through knowing the factors. But you see what we're doing? We're using all the tools we have in front of us to make a good sound decision, obviously a safe decision as to what we are going to do with these aircraft. Remember that air traffic control is not so much about separating airplanes. Airplanes, for the most part, stay separated from each other. There's some close calls. You see videos of them all the time. Funny VFR incidences where aircraft come really, really close. Yeah, it's hard to crash two aircraft, but that's not our job. Our job is to protect the protected airspace of these aircraft. So our job is to play the game, but it played exceedingly well because we are keeping the aircraft not only separated from each other, but the five mile bubble around those aircraft, five miles laterally, a thousand feet on either side of the aircraft, we are keeping that bubble, if you will, intact and perfectly safe. That's what we're doing. And we have to guarantee that. And right now, as it looks, it's not looking the best way to do that is to just let these aircraft fly and figure it out as we get to Don Ku. No, now is the time to establish a plan and to see what you're going to do. So now that that long tangent's over, let's get to the next slide and let's talk about some other factors at play, knowing what we know now and knowing what we can know with more information as it comes available. But here we go through Don Ku, exactly. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So presented to you are two images, the one on the right is the image we've been dealing with all presentation long. It is our snapshot of the sector with all of our aircraft converging on Dongku and how we are going to solve this conflict. 
The one on the left is a viewpoint of Miami Center, sectors 63, also known as the Serta sector, and to a lesser extent, Miami 62, known as Grand Turk. We showed you at the beginning of this presentation, and we kind of made it one of our most potent points, if you will, that lots of airways, five airways, and one non-published SID transition converge at Donku. But what do we have on our side? If we take a closer look as to what will happen on the other side of San Juan's airspace, so right over here, this area, right? Sometimes we don't care about it because it's not our responsibility, it's not our airspace. But having a little bit of knowledge of what happens after these aircraft go over Donku will help you solve this situation. Know where you are sending these aircraft. We know according to the Miami and San Juan Center letter of agreement that traffic flying over Donku may transition via direct over Rena, Leton, Lenholm, Lamer, and Lucky. If they are inbound to these fixes and they are over Donku, which they should be, they can proceed direct. Cool. We know that at least some of this traffic will diverge immediately after passing Donku. We also know that a lot of the airways that these aircraft are established on will either transition them via that direct or take them to these fixes just by virtue of the airway themselves. Now, if we were to take a slide back, go back and see what all the strips showed us what these aircraft were doing, I'm almost positive that a lot of these aircraft are all on different Lima Airways. And actually, we can probably deduce that too. I'm almost positive Delta 559 and Delta 349 share a common airway. I'm pretty sure they're both on Yankee 185. Pretty sure FedEx 58 is on Yankee 185 as well. JetBlue, I believe, was on Lima 454 after Don Koo. United 1039, I think, was Lima 451. And Air Canada 960, I'm almost positive, was Lima 452. What does that mean? So we have three customers all in the same general area wanting to go over Rena eventually. That's fine. We can accommodate this by doing what? Here comes the technique. Who has been flying the longest? It's Delta 349. First come, first serve. They're currently at 32. That's fine. They're occupying that airspace. FedEx 58 wants flight level 340. Okay noted, and Delta 559 is at 36. So when you have climbing aircraft, sometimes the best thing to do is to understand that eventually they will get their final requested altitude, but it may not be with you. It may not be with San Juan Center, and that's perfectly fine. We've talked about it in large detail, how large or how small, depending on what viewpoint you have, Sector 6 is. It is not a lot of space to get aircraft to their requested altitude, especially if it's really high. But in this case, with a whole bunch of aircraft converging on a common point, sometimes you have to stop them intermittently. And not just intermittently for you, but put that aircraft at that altitude and keep them there until they get into Miami Center's airspace, 63, and they fan out. You see all the endless possibilities that can happen in Sector 63's airspace. There is room for Miami to climb these aircraft. Maybe not right off the bat, but eventually these aircraft, you can think to yourself with a relative fair amount of peace of mind that these aircraft will get their requested altitude as they make their way towards the fixes that they filed over. You see how that airspace structure starts creating lateral separation as soon as they hit Donku? It's very helpful. So stopping aircraft at intermittent altitude is a great technique for you to keep the aircraft safe. As we know, altitude separation is one of the most efficient forms that we have available, made available to us because it's only a thousand feet. Also, too, you can APRAC direct. If you think direct Leton will get United 1039 out of the way faster or direct Rena for one of your uh, uh, manly bound aircraft who are on Yankee 185, you can easily do that. But just remember, who's you think to yourself, first come, first serve, who's flying the longest? Also, another thing to consider, if an aircraft is at a cruising altitude and you know that some of the aircraft that who have departed terminal areas would like to be at or above their altitude, maybe ask if 
these aircraft who have been established flying a long time, are they able higher? Can you bump somebody up to 38? So 36 becomes more readily available and the picture becomes more clear on what altitudes can be given as we get closer to Dong Ku. That's another thing to consider. United 1039 has been flying a good distance. They departed Aruba. JetBlue's flying a, eh, more or less the same time as United departing Bird. Air Canada 960, same story. And everybody else, Delta 349 has been flying since St. Lucia. That's another candidate. Maybe they can go up. Something to consider. Remember that your plan must be flexible and don't be afraid to, you know, let an aircraft know, A, expect higher with Miami Center. This is temporary due to traffic at Dong Ku. Paint the picture for them. Let them know the plan. Let them know what to expect after they diverge after this common point. It's really, really not too bad. But that's where the confidence comes in. Confidence, you as a controller say, hey, you know what? I, I know what I'm doing. I have a plan. It's the safest plan. It's as efficient as I can possibly make it. So this is the way it's got to be. I don't have a lot of space to take care of this situation. Now, some of the things to consider. We've always talked about how Sector 4 is absolutely huge. Now, if these aircraft say if you had a business jet, a Citation, a Global Express, Gulfstream, an aircraft requesting a very, very high altitude, higher than 36. If they're requesting your, you know, the, the 43 stratum, the 40 stratum, well, this is the opportunity to start using Sector 4 to your advantage and vectoring, like we talked about, vectoring for climb, putting these aircraft out of the way and providing a patch of airspace not too far away, not too far off the beaten path of on course for Dong Ku, where these aircraft could climb. It works all the time. You don't want to stop an aircraft who has filed for the upper 40s or 40 and above underneath all these aircraft. More or less, the airliners will be able to ride out a temporary stop at 30, 28 for the duration of Sector 6. As we talked about, it's not that large of a sector. The hangout at 28 and expect a higher altitude passing Donku is not a fair deal. It's not a bad bargain at all. Some things to consider when you are keeping aircraft relatively low. Uh, 28, sometimes when bads, when rides are really bad, when uh, the conditions kind of deteriorate for good rides in the 30s, and we have aircraft transitioning and wanting to cruise at 24, 26. Just remember, according to our letter of agreement, that aircraft are going to cross Batir at 27, or correction, cross uh, Fipec at 27, going direct Batir. So just keep in mind that aircraft will be descending around the boundary to make a restriction at Fipec at 27 so they can get to Batir at 13 if they're landing Punta Cana. So keep that in mind. That's something to watch out for, especially slow climbers on the Akoni 3 departure, the Donku transition. So just keep that in mind as well. And remember, you are always able to change the plan for the better. If you start seeing the way aircraft are starting to fall in line at Donku, as they start making that turn to be all lined up and you start seeing what kind of entrail and longitudinal separation you have, taking a look at speeds, maybe some aircraft are 30, maybe 40 knots faster than the aircraft at cruise, then you'd see that separation is ever increasing. And you can hand that off to Miami with peace of mind. Maybe you, it requires you to use the Mach number technique for aircraft. I could see that being a possibility, seeing how Delta 559 and FedEx 48, even though they're requesting different altitudes, perhaps you can see how Mach number technique would work out if you're able to get two aircraft in trail at 36 to free up 34 for some of these other players here. So remember, it's fluid, it's dynamic, and how you react to that is going to determine what kind of success you have on the other side of Dong Ku. And that's fine. We've armed you now with multiple uh, tools in that tool belt and things to consider to give you confidence to run a sector the way you want to and the way your trainer and training team would like you to see you do it. So fantastic job with that, uh, really good job. Not the most interactive presentation day, not a lot of phraseology or anything like that, just methods and ways for you to kind of navigate your way around this tricky fix. And it is tricky and it's gonna seem overwhelming. It is overwhelming. You have a whole bunch of aircraft all pointing at the same fix and all of them want the same altitude. 
Well, that's where you come in. That's where you get paid the big bucks for to separate these aircraft and to provide an efficient service after that safety aspect, of course. So great job with that today. I hope we kind of kind of took a chunk out of that iceberg and kind of explored the way you um, look at converging situations, not so much in the transitioning environment going to uh, the approach phase of flight. We've talked about vectoring for sequence, vectoring for Slugo and Bino and Sailor, but this is the first time we talk about converging situations in the uh, departure phase of flight or the en route stage of flight because we're often spoiled. Just about every other fix that is not over Miami, uh, the Miami boundary, we have to guarantee some other kind of separation that is not bare minimum radar separation. Usually we're talking about minutes in trail with the New York stuff, Mach number technique, or we just go out vertical with all of our other facilities. But this is the first time where you are able to use speed, aircraft characteristics, and knowing all that, making a decision on, hey, can I use minimum or close to minimum radar separation here as these aircraft transition out of my airspace? Well, things to consider. So great job with that today. Let's go to the uh, ending slide and have a final discussion. Great job. Well, would you look at that, a future Darm Coup customer there looking like American uh, 783 or 753 from Charlotte, that wonderful Airbus A330-200. No doubt they'll be going over Darm Coup when they leave the airspace. So a nice little picture there of a beautiful day, some plane spotting at San Juan International. So great job with everything today, guys. I know it was kind of a lengthy discussion kind of presentation, not a lot of guidance on what exactly to do. But then again, this situation is a blank canvas waiting for you to apply your paint strokes and really figure it out yourself because you are able to. Knowing the tools and being armed with them and knowing the facts of what happens immediately before with the converging at Donku and the diverging after, you're going to be able to make a decision on, hey, what can I do to make it through this session, keeping everybody safe and being as efficient and as fair as possible? And we've talked about all those points in detail as we went through the presentation. So yeah, it's been a more of a discussion, a forum, but you can go back and look at the slides and see what you would do and apply the phraseology that we have covered in other presentations and solve the situation. It easily could have been solved. Maybe aircraft have to get stopped temporarily, but that's just the way it is to keep them safe. And you will no doubt do that as you sit down for sessions here in the future. I really appreciate you guys spending time with me today. Always enjoy this time we have together talking shop, talking air traffic control. I hope it's been helpful, especially as we apply things going forward, trying to get into more detailed things now that we have some of the broader concepts out of the way. Taking care of these hot spots in San Juan Center's airspace is really fun to do. And just talking our way through them and then applying it when you find yourself in a, uh, sitting down for a session, whether it's on the job training or in the Dyson environment. You are going to do fantastic. I have all the faith in the world that you are willing and able to take care of these situations. So Steve here wishing you nothing but the best. Have a fantastic day and keep those attitudes just like your separation positive. I will see you at the next uh, presentation.